From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Part 7 of our wrap-up series brings together the best insights from our previous episodes and is a great way to jump in and sample the Drive Phase content. We've taken the opportunity on this episode to reflect on those conversations and we've selected clips from our guests over the last nine episodes are covering a key range of topics. We also want to take the opportunity to thank all our listeners for your support and ask that you subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Spotify. Welcome to this week's episode of the Drive Face Podcast and part seven of our Lessons from Leaders series. Enjoy the show. We love to hear origin stories on the pod. Justin Merritt, Peter Arch and James Mapstone share the inception of their organisations with us. I had a, a clear plan in terms of, yeah, I knew I wanted to engage with young players. I'd been working in a school's market previously. And yeah, that was a natural evolution for me was to start doing some of my own things. And, mm. and it was all about the philosophy of how we structured the sessions, though, how to make it fun and engaging that first experience or those formative years, getting lots of activity, lots of opportunity to practice, but also bringing in fun elements of competition. So um, and that was yeah, the driver for me was let's create a simple model that can be replicated and the quality is there. And then, yeah, as we developed, it was finding like minded coaches, a lot that I was meeting through football, through sport, but also through local university as well. So Oxford Brooks at that time had a strong sports degree, lots of graduates coming out who didn't really know necessarily what they wanted to do next. So, and that was the start for our growth in Oxfordshire. Because this is, um, well, company's 20 plus years old, right? So this is, nine, was it 1999, end of, end, you know, turn of the century. So at that point, you, you kind of ahead of the game right? you're probably one of the first companies in, in and around compared to now obviously in the competition that we have in the, in the sector That's um, right. you, yeah. you kind of got a, a running start at everyone else so what was what was the environment like at that point was the schools kind of receptive to it or to your programs and... in, initially not it wasn't quite as easy particularly in, in terms of PE daytime sessions there was always the the provision for after school Honestly, I remember it to this day. I was living in Connecticut, which is in the northeast of uh, the US. It was the middle of the winter and it was snowing. And I had to make this decision. I had one beer left in the fridge. And I went and I sat on the front step and I just thought, there's no way that I'm going to go back now. I, you know, I've, I've made this leap. I'm going to make something happen. And I remembered that a guy had given me a business card three years ago when I was in Oxford. I'd been doing a coaching session on a Saturday morning. And this guy was just running around the outside of the pitch. And after the coaching session, he came over to me and said, look, if you ever want a job in America, give me a call. So, like, oh, interesting. And kind of, thank you very much. Didn't think much more of it. Put the, uh, put the business card in my wallet. And then when we had this problem with my employer in, in Connecticut, I got the business card out and I called this guy and said, you know, you probably don't remember me, but you gave me this business card three years ago. And he said, oh, I remember you. Uh, he said, funny you should call. We got some opportunities down here in Kansas City. So I basically said, well, I'm prepared to look at anything right now. Went down to Kansas City and he showed me these incredible indoor soccer facilities, you know, uh, 60,000 square feet. The new one was 75,000 square feet. It had two indoor soccer fields a little bit like ice hockey arenas with boards and then had multiple other sporting areas in the in the building so this and, would have been this would have been state of the art right so they like oh yeah astroturf we would have astroturf back then no? absolutely yeah yeah. yeah yeah okay and it was you know packed with not just kids but adults who played and they developed this high level of participation in adult recreational soccer men's women's co-ed and then obviously all the the high school and all the junior divisions that was you know the opportunity i jumped at it. I came down. I helped run a few camps that were, were associated with this, almost like a counter-cyclical revenue source. You know, less people play indoor in the summer. So let's do some out- outdoor summer camps. And so, so in terms of these facilities, they're just purely community. Well, it feels like a community facility, but it's purely like commercial leisure facility that they're private you know, enterprise. building on spec to say, right, we think there's a market for this. And right. Yeah. 
Also, no not tied to a club or anything like that. That's what I'm trying to write. Okay. Yeah, it was no support from a club, no support from the city, county, the state. It was, it's a business. You do your business model and you project how many teams you can get playing an eight week season, how many are going to re sign the following year. You model that out, how many referees you need, what the electrical costs, you know, what are all the other support services you can do in that building. And it is, it, it, it was for me, a, a, you know, the start of a crash course in business. And one of the partners of that business, who is still a partner of Challenger Sports today, was the business guy. And he was very, very bright. So, you know, for the next 25 years, he basically taught me everything you would learn if I'd have gone to a business school. So, you know, I've come out of out of education. I've had a little time in a gym, back in education, out in the camps. And then I moved to Kansas City and started working with this guy. And the plan originally was to duplicate these indoor facilities all over the U.S., they became very capital intensive and we found it harder to raise the money and get these buildings built. We built a brand new one in St. Louis, which was, you know, incredible facility. We added basketball and volleyball and a golf driving range and a few other things there, a gymnastics school in addition to the soccer. And, you know, unfortunately that didn't take off the way we wanted it to. It was hard work. And on a parallel time, I was working with the soccer camp program and we grew it from my first year of, you know, 35 camps using a handful of staff. And we grew and we grew and we were doing 100 camps and then 150 camps and we had opportunities to spread out and take these out. Yeah, but also of where most of our clients were local authorities, uh, it was the beginning of the austerity period. So they didn't have the money to spend on facility developments and a consequence there wasn't work for consultants to to help them on their facilities and their strategies so it went from thinking oh we've got a couple of lean months where we're not winning any orders to cracky there's not enough money to run the business now i wasn't a director of the company i was i was a manager but there was a pretty um formative experience when there was a ring at the door and i answered it on the entry phone and some guys said i'm sorry to tell you we're here from the official receivers we're coming to um to close down the company so it was a trying to take the positives out of this, it showed me firstly how well the company had grown and all the success factors for its growth, but also the hard lesson that if things don't go right with the market, it can come to end very quickly. Yeah, Yeah. I'm assuming it's, like you said, successfully grown and well run. It's just, yeah, if the market market shifts, then it shifts, doesn't it? Totally, yeah. And that was the end of that. So we were pretty much made redundant on the spot, uh, all the employees. So it was a a very, very tough time. I guess to bounce back, I was not sure of your age at the time or the circumstances, but that's got to be a shock to anyone kind of losing losing your job or being made redundant. I guess, oh. What was your mindset coming out of that? Do you, have, do you have a family at the time and stuff? I did, yeah. I had a young family. We just had our, our second child. She was, uh, let's think, probably about, she was three years old. Our eldest was five. So that was all a struggle. My wife was sort of slowly getting back to work and things like that after having kids. So it was a tr- difficult time for us. But this may sound like a cliche, and I'm not trying to say this was easy, but one door closed and another door opened. And I realized, well, with my consultancy skills, I could actually still deliver some consultancy work. And I had a, a, a few clients I had really good relationships with. So I kept some projects going through them. And then... Probably easy for you to go in as a, I guess, freelancer without that big overhead or charging as much as you had to, you know, a bit more, a bit more nimble, agile, and pick totally. up the smaller ones. That are good for you, you got it, James. Yeah, that's yeah. it. It's a bit, bit more agile, uh, slightly lower fees, could be a bit more responsive. And then after doing that for a few months, I there was an opportunity to come up for an interim management position or interim chief exec, in fact, from an organization you might remember called ISPAL, the Institute for Sport, Parks and Leisure. And what was happening, this was going through a merger with ISRM. They were the two big membership bodies for like leisure and sport and so on. And the idea was to create the Chartered Institute for Sport and Physical Activity. So I had a, my job there was to really work through from the ISPAL side, this Mm -hmm. merger. And effectively we were creating what's now become SIMSPA, the Chartered Institute for Management of Sport and Physical Activity, right there in the early days. So it was all the kind of, there was legal stuff to do. There was the staff transfer. There was dealing with the assets. And again, it was another big learning experience for me to get in there and do that change management piece and to get this thing going. And now, of course, um, you know, SIMSPA is going from, from strength to strength and everybody is getting engaged with them. Yeah, so I was in a prison officer for a year and then I got a job as a physical education instructor. Uh, and then about four years later, I was physical education manager. So running the department, uh, nine staff. Uh, and that was, for me, that was an opportunity to look back and think, right, as a young manager trying to make a bit of a mark, 
what can we do that's different? What can we do that maybe hasn't been done before? And I remember looking through different prisons or trying to find as much as I could. And then I started looking outside. And it was the time when some of the big colleges were sort of rebranded as sports colleges. And they had sort of pathways into pro football or rugby or whatever, boxing, or whatever it might be. The brands were professional clubs. And I thought, wow, if that was around when I was a kid, that would have been amazing. I wonder if we can recreate something like that within the prison. And that's what we set up to do. And I think that probably started me on the journey of where I am now, that we set up 13 different academies, all linked to, to pro clubs, all with coaches coming in in sort of uniforms, providing that additional support. And it became of how can we use that as a way to motivate and influence young people to not only behave when they're in the gym, but how can we influence that behaviour when they're off, when they're out of the gym, when they're on the wings, when they're in education, when they're walking around the prison? What can we do? How can we sort of try and improve daily life of being in prison? And, and we just kind of worked towards that goal to the point I think we overdid it. We had such a relationship uh, with young people that they would knock on the door. And this is this is this is how it got in about 2007, which made it had to all change. 2007, I'd get a knock on the door and say, right, boss. I'm leaving this end of this week. I'm going to go out. I'm going to have a great weekend. I'm going to reoffend. I'm going to go to court. I'm going to ask them to send me back to Ashfield. So can you please put me down for the next course? I'll, try, I'll be back in time. And that started happening two or three times. And it was like, wow. And I remember sitting down with the team saying, right, what we've done is amazing, but we now need to do more to support through the gate. And as we started to try and do that, because it was new for us, we we're only ever used to sort of working with people in, in the gym in that prison. I remember being told, Fat boy, it's not, that's not your job. Your job is when one leaves, another one comes in, manage that gym. I guess for me, it felt like a complete wasted opportunity. And that's when I left to set up, set up my first social enterprise, which was called Second Chance Project. Alison Tripney, Peter Arch and Marcus Kingwell share their management and leadership styles with us. Yeah, uh, you're so right, because... Someone said to me, actually, I, I think it was Rob at, at West Brom, can't be everything to everyone. So you've got to be really clear. And one of the things that helped with our clarity was just producing a really simple three-year strategy. With, it was underpinned by our values and a really accessible document. Like it's only like two, the equivalent of two sides of A4 of text. You know, I didn't want something that would just, you know, we'd find in the stock cupboard in ten years. On the shelf, time. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> popping open the fire doors. So. Um, that that really helped us. So we we just work to three key themes, and that's education. You won't be surprised here. Health and well-being, and then community development, which is everything that that takes place within our sort of community hub sites, really. And that really helped us because actually, if you say yes to everything, you wouldn't be able to deliver it to the to the highest standards that your your community members deserve. So you've got to be really clear about. What, who you are and what what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Because I think one of our challenges in football with clubs, community organisations is that we're, we are quite multi-dimensional charities. So we're not just education or we're not just health. We're, we're a combination of three themes, really. So in terms of presenting it and get that mess, getting that message across, that you've got to be really clear about that. And, and it's, it's actually as important to know what you're not going to do as it is to know what you are going to do. Great question. And it has been like a, a living and breathing MBA through the original Challenger experiences. Yeah, that's then, what it felt like as you talk to them. Yeah. Well. And then the, the recent, the last few years, last three years with Gymshark has been like a new age business education because of the way that the business is run it's uh, it is very different to the traditional way of business. It, you know, it is very digital. It's very specialized. However, my my kind of underlying business philosophies have always been people based. Even sometimes to the uh, sometimes it conflicted with what we would want to do as a business. I would often I'd speak up and say I prefer we don't do that because of the impact it'll have on our staff. Or you know, I don't see that this will actually help the customers do what they want to do. And I've, I've kind of been a, a cheerleader and a team leader for the staff throughout my whole life. Uh, when I came to Gymshark this year, you know, we we bought a whole bunch of people in from other cities. And in November, we have this big holiday here called Thanksgiving. 
and you know it's a big family you go back to your family and you have a big meal a little bit like easter and christmas over in the uh, the uk and you know i i thought well man we've relocated a few people here they may need somewhere to go so i kind of went around the office and said look if you haven't got anywhere to go for thanksgiving i want you to come to my house and i'm going to cook for you and then we ended up with 19 people coming to visit us <laughs> so i was cooking for two days creating it but just the sense of family we had around the table was incredible and people just kind of relaxed and got to know each other, which they weren't able to do at work. And having that interpersonal relationships between the staff has been very important to me everywhere we've gone. But we had a similar thing at Challenger. Every year in September, we would take our full-time staff, which was, you know, 90 to 100. We'd take them to Las Vegas for a week and we would do educational classes. We'd do new product rollout. We'd do staff reviews. And then we would have just an incredible amount of fun. And just three weeks ago, I went back to Kansas City to the National Soccer Coaches uh, Convention. There were 5,000 coaches there. And we held an evening for alumni, past members of Challenger Sports. Anybody who'd come over and work for Challenger, if you are now a coach at a pro club or a college or whatever, come and have a beer with us. We put, we opened So that's going to be a big bar tub, right? <laughs> it was. And it was probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever seen. You know, hundreds of coaches coming in just saying, thank you. I, I can't believe I started as a little soccer coach in the summer camps who really didn't know what they were doing. And now I'm working at a college, top college, or I'm working with a pro club. And it's absolutely that sense of family that we've developed and talking to the full-time staff, most of the conversations would go back to, and do you remember Vegas? Do you remember the time we had there? And it is these memories you create for people who bond together. If all you do is work together, you know, if, if that's it, that's great. You know, and if somebody offers you a bigger paycheck, sometimes you'll jump and you'll go and work for a bigger paycheck. But if you've got these bonds and other attachments, keeping people to a business, that culture is so important. And, and I think very often in business, people overlook that. I think they're sure. too busy making money and selling their product. That's such a good question, James, because if you'd asked me that probably four years ago, four or five years ago, I would have said, yes, absolutely. I've got certain ways of working. And strangely, I've now come to realize that I need to hold my beliefs lightly. In other words, be prepared to shift on some of these principles and recognize that the world's moving on and every organization's different and it always takes a different a different tack. So, I mean, there's still some, some basic things I believe in. I've always been a collaborator. I've always seeked consensus. I've always believed in, in teamwork. I've always believed in building alliances. So my, my style is, is collegiate rather than hero management. You know, I, I'm not the guy that kind of thumps the table and says, here's the plan. I've written it already and you've all got to strive for this. You know, it's just not the way I work. But what I want to do is bring people together. And I think I've been reasonably successful in doing that. But the learning for me is, of course, every group of people that you sit in front of is different from the last one. So you've really got to ad adapt your approach, you know, potentially quite, quite significantly in how that happens, thinking of all the little nuances and strengths and weaknesses that people have got. So that's, those are my two things. Yes, I'm, a, I'm definitely a collaborator, but it's, it's don't go in with a fixed model, go in with the ability to flex and change and make it fit the particular circumstance. The sports coaching and physical activity sector is expanding rapidly with demand for services across the globe. Peter Arch outlines the opportunities available to organizations that want to grow. Yeah, we are really bullish about what's going to happen in the future. The sport is going to continue to grow. It's actually, there's an interesting thing that's happened to the sport. It's actually kind of almost professionalized where large soccer clubs are now starting to take over in, in each city and they gobble up and consolidate a lot of the smaller clubs. And these clubs now employ their own director of coaching and age group directors and a kit uh, coordinator and everything else. So now there is, uh, we're having to work harder, spread our, our kind of ourselves across the country even further and go to the markets where you don't have a club affiliated to a major league soccer team, you know, almost like a feeder team where they've got, you know, 10,000 kids now that are, it's almost like creating a supporter base as well as creating a, a, a coached soccer organization. So uh, yeah, that opportunity is there. Also the, we are continuing to look at tech opportunities. You know, every club is going to need online registration, league management software, a streaming educational element to that, to be able to teach their volunteer coaches so that there's a, an enormous opportunity there. You know, I, I think there's 
there was one thing that I would leave any job for tomorrow if I found it. And that would be a, a really cool fundraising opportunity because not only does every soccer club need fundraising, every youth sports club, boys and girls scouts, every school, and they all kind of roll out the same, you know, old age, selling trash bags, selling candies, <laughs> yeah. car watches and things like that. We were lucky enough to have CEO of Women in Sports, Stephanie Hilborn on the show. And I asked her how gender stereotypes are impacting female participation in sport. Yeah, no, I mean, we know, I and mean, we're doing a lot of research obviously now, and so some of this comes from what I've seen personally and some of it from my research, but the expectations, gender stereotyping starts kind of at birth, doesn't it? When the mm. midwife passes the baby across, if you've got a father there and says, oh, it's a boy, you'll be able to play football with him. You know, literally, that's where it starts. And it, you never look back. So, you know, that if you're about to send your kid to school, and they're a boy and they don't know how to kick a ball, you tend to make sure they do know how to kick a ball. <laughs> Whereas if it's a girl, it's like, well, you'll be fine. You, your job's to kind of look pretty and, and be a girl, you know. And so even before primary, we know that physical literacy skills are lower in girls because there hasn't been that cultural expectation. They must learn these basic skills, you know, yeah. around things like balls or running or, you know, whatever. They're probably more like to run about, but certainly ball skills, stuff like that. And then when they get to primary, then the, the wider gender stereotypes from teachers and other influences kick in and the playground gets dominated by the boys who get fed up with these girls who don't even know how to kick a ball and anyway they're trying to prove to their mates how great they are so you know the playground dynamic is a really negative factor even at primary but what we see is yeah then it plays through different ages and I think you know when you're a parent who's trying to actively give your daughter the same chances as your son and then you send them into the peer group or into the environment of the school where there isn't enough resource really to give any of the kids really good sort of PE experiences but certainly the sort of more informal side the boys are going to dominate you can see it's just not going to work for the girls at the moment there really is and so our, the recent research we just put out this week was about some research we'd done with teenage girls and the thing that the aspect that surprised us about most was not that they were dropping out past as boys which they were and kind of people know that but that 43 percent of those girls who were dropping out used to love sport so we were talking about over a million girls around this country teenage girls so more than the population of Birmingham around the same population of Birmingham were dropping out even though they used to love sport. So what's going on there? You know, and that is just a, what we're seeing with the research we do is there's this cumulative impact. So there's the sort of preschool, they're not learning the same skills. At primary school, their self-belief is declining. So self-belief mm. during primary years, the boys are staying equal. Would have been great if the boys had gone up, but it's staying equal. The girls, it's dropping down. And then they enter secondary school before they even got, you know, puberty and periods and all that stuff happening. They're entering it at a lower point. So then, you know, female puberty is a pretty brutal experience. So, you know, what, 12, 13 or whatever, and you're having to manage all this, blah, I don't know if you're too grisly, but, you know, you're just a kid. And then you might, you might not have any advice about how to manage that for sport. That's really off-putting. Yeah. Not a surprise thing to say, but also not having the right sports bra, you know, just not having the right advice or the expectation that, of course, you will manage that. You will manage that. You can, you can manage that. And then you layer in that whole sort of social media stereotyping of how you're meant to look, how you're not meant to be sweaty, how you're meant to be dolled up to the nines constantly, you know, layer in all of that. So everything is pushing them away from taking part in sport. And the biggest gender gap is in participation in team sport with 23% gap, you know, 23% fewer girls and boys are, are engaged in team sport. And for me, that for us, you know, that is the way you maybe learn most life skills. Because you're, you know, you're not just having to be great at your own, with your own skill, you're having to learn to communicate, to lead, to take risks on behalf of the whole team, to accept on other people's muck up, you know, to mm. all the things you actually really need in life. That's a really big factor. And whilst there has been an improvement, we did a survey a year or so ago about of people between the age of 13, 25, I think it was around that. So older kids, younger adults, and 60% of the boys were dreaming of reaching the top in sport and only 30% of the girls. Now, I we didn't do a survey 10 years ago. I reckon it would have been lower for girls 10 years. Ago. So that's yeah. even with the sort of coverage that we're getting now, the girls aren't dreaming in the same way. So despite this progress, you know, at the front end, culture takes a long time to change and the, and the culture within the school environment within the peer group, particularly with social media, 
is still meaning that girls are losing out. Great communication is key for all leaders. Marcus Kingwell and James Mupstone share how they use different strategies to move their business forward. I was, yes. Yeah, so that was another change management job. I was interim chief exec there, and this was largely driven by Sport England, although the the, the five CSPs had wanted it themselves. They were called proactives and there was they had each geographical territories for parts of London. And it was the same problem, really, a bit like ISPAL and ISRM that I talked about in that you might be a, a club in a particular area and thinking, well, who do I talk to? I'm a London-based club and you've got to find out, are you are you in West London or in or South West London? Yeah, you're in North yeah, West. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or are, you, are you in Middlesex? Or yeah. sometimes there's Surrey, you know. So it was all confusing. So the job was to merge these five organisations together, which were all separately constituted. They had their own bank balances, different IT systems, different groups of staff, different boards. So I had to get in there and pull the whole thing together, really, a series of series of transfers, which was probably my main, my big exposure to politics, which I'd never really understood before. The board was chaired by an MP, by Kate Hoey, uh, who was a former minister for sport. So she had her, her own uh, kind of way of looking at the world. And there was also the mayor's office was involved because they were, they had an interest in sport and a sports department. So there was lots of that kind of big P politics going on, which was a real interesting experience for me to, to understand how that stuff works. There's once had um, a couple of mentors from the business community, done very well for themselves, came in to work with us as a social enterprise for six months. Long story short, we did loads of stuff. And at the end of the six months, they said, you've done, you've been brilliant these last six months. You've come along. It's so You've come along so far. You should be really proud of yourself. Can I be brutally honest with you? I said, look, the only thing that has really changed in the last six months is the way that I can explain what we do to you and how we do it. So if you actually look on paper, not a lot has really changed. What you've been able to do in the last six months is help me sort of speak your language and explain it to you. And it goes back to the school days of going to a completely new school, completely different groups, being able to speak the language with different groups, whether you're working with people on a landing or a wing of a prison, in a gym, in parliament, everybody has their own sort of language. And maybe they're used to speaking a certain language. And if you don't fall into that mold or speak the same language your your voice or your mission can get lost so i think the having to speak so many different languages and now we do a lot say around government and quality and learning that has been or been able to adapt to that so quickly has probably helped get us where we are now yeah and I, I think that's a it can go the other way as well though if, obviously for you you're really authentic with it and you come across it's like you're talking in their language but you're still who you are whereas you can see some flip the other way and just i don't know what you're saying anymore i don't understand when i, when I first started going into government and sort of Parliament and doing some of that work, I would quite often get confused to somebody who's been in prison, who's turned their life around and now trying to do this great work. Was that? <laughs> and I had to dress a bit differently. I grew my hair back for a little bit. I had a little side part and going on for a bit and then sort of tried to speak differently, look differently. And, and sadly, the impact was huge. So as soon as I sort of like re-established who we are, why we were there uh, and what we were doing, and that message was across, it was back to a, back to a grade one all over and carry on as normal but it was sad that I felt like I had to do that and it was a real decision but the, the impact was clear it was quick Charlie Ford Tom Clark Forrest and Justin Merritt discuss how they approach developing their communities and leveraging the profile and impact of sport you're completely right 100% this is the uniqueness of this sport so there, there isn't another sport out there that is centrally placed within within these kind of hard to reach deprived communities. So 62% of our clubs are based within those uh, IMD levels, one to four, the indices of multiple deprivation. And interestingly and, and importantly, they are run by people who live in those communities. So they understand the challenges their membership faces on a day by day basis. And that puts them in a really unique position in, uh, in relation to attracting new members, being able to break down some really deep-rooted societal issues. We've got a, a lot of evidence. We ran, we ran an insight, a research project through Sheffield Hallam University that has kind of really brought this to the floor in terms of its uniqueness. But there are some fantastic quotes within that really prove why boxing is, uh, you know, is able to do it. So, for example, in many cases, the boxing coach is seen as the only 
uh, I suppose, stable and constant within these young people's lives. And because of the relationship that they're able to, to develop. And I think there's a psychological element to this as well, because I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the reason why boxing clubs are, are great in terms of molding opinions and, and changing lives is that when you walk into a boxing gym, you're met with equal part excitement and equal part fear. And that puts you in a really, really good place psychologically. Um, and we've got so many examples of where if a boxing coach tells you to do something, you do it. And these are th these are young people that maybe do not have that same level of respect for police officers or for, for parents or, or teachers. And, and this is where, again, the, the sport is leaned upon very heavily. And we have a lot of partnerships with uh, people referral units with with the police. We've got a program called Knockout Extremism, which works with the Cannes Terrorism Office, where we use boxing as a way in which to divert young people away from potentially being radicalised. The sport of boxing can do so much more beyond what you may see in terms of two boxers stepping into a ring and having a bit of a dust up. Yeah, we were working in, you know, the typical shanty towns, favelas in Sao Paulo and lived just outside of that with a Brazilian family. So it was a, you know, a real immersion in that culture, that experience and sport and youth work was really central to what we did there. So it was probably my first real and meaningful and impactful experience of witnessing sport and sport as a vehicle and a tool and how it can be used to work with young people as well as youth work more generally. And so I wouldn't say the idea of Sport for Life um, necessarily started in Brazil because, you know, there was still three years of university ahead of me, but it certainly helped me in my grounding and witnessing the power of sport. No, not really. My dad was actually very, very quiet. I've had a number of in inspirational coaches as, uh, in junior clubs, and I think they were just, they taught me, it's not always about the input technically, tactically, or but one of my coaches for the youth team that I played for as a, as a junior, uh, he just made it so much fun and you wanted to go there and learn off everybody else. So I think that inspirational leader who can have fun, can have a joke, but also could connect with individuals, that was really important for me. And as I progressed, um, so right from, like you say, you know, I was at Watford from nine years old all the way through till I was 19. And every kind of year you had different coaches, but big influence on me was when I signed as a YTS. Um, Kenny Jackett was the youth team manager in his first role then. And oh, well. he's gone on to manage a lot of teams. And But he, he sort of instilled a lot of uh, discipline for training, timekeeping, being a decent person, and a lot of things that have shaped how I've sort of interacted with people over the years so it's very interesting how formative you are at those young ages and the influences that coaches and managers and leaders can have on you. Peter Arch gives us the behind the scenes story of how Gymshark took their unique culture to the US while James Mapstone and Alison Tripney speak about their experience starting out in new roles. Well, if we start with that one, I, I basically did a deep dive into all the major metropolitan areas in the US, needed to cross-reference them. They had to have a direct flight to Heathrow, I had to have a direct flight to LA and to Toronto, which is where we knew we were going to put two of our warehouses. And then there were a whole bunch of other factors that I needed to look at. And if you kind of fast forward and you, you look at Denver, it is a, a unique city who has attracted some of the biggest names in tech to move here from California recently. Google have put a massive facility in here, bringing tens of thousands of jobs. Twitter have just taken six floors of a building uh, not far from here. Facebook have got a regional office here. Slack have got an office here. Home advisors and, and the, the list goes on. Denver has attracted them because, you know, some of your, your listeners will know they may have been out here. It is one of the most beautiful cities in North America. You know, we have the whole of the Rocky Mountain range on the west side of the city. And currently, you know, they're snow capped and they are, it's like being in the Swiss Alps. And you're a short ride away if you, uh, you know, if you want to do skiing or snowboarding or walking or hiking or biking. It's just active lifestyle, right? It's the culture. They're, it is part of the Denver culture is mm. people having this work-life balance. They really understand that, yes, I work hard, but also I've got to enjoy the incredible nature and the incredible uh, facilities that we have here to go and, and do recreation at the weekends. And you'll see on a Friday afternoon, just a massive line of cars heading up to the mountains. 
and they'll spend the, the weekends up in Vale or Aspen or Breckenridge uh, and then, you know, back again here and back in the office. And it's something which is obviously you can attract and retain talent with something more than an office. You know, it is the lifestyle here that is people looking at saying, wow, this is just a really cool town to be in. Touching on what you said there around, um, obviously those huge, huge um, companies coming in from the tech side. I'm sure you, you're employing and recruiting tech talent as well. That's got to be a challenge going up against those guys for um, recruiting, especially tech talent anyway. So it's going to get, it's getting, I guess, the place to be, but that could be, have some, some drawbacks as well from, from the competition side. Yeah, we, we've got a slight advantage there that our tech side is still handled in the UK by the parent company. And oh, they are just sure. ramping up. I think we had 90 members of staff a year ago. We're going to have 230 in our tech team this year coming. We have a small tech support team out, out here. But we do, we compete for talent and these companies are driving wages up. You know, they're able to offer, you know, very lucrative packages. There's a VF Corporation, the parent company of North Face, uh, who also own Timberland and, a, you know, a whole host of other companies. They move their corporate office right down the street from us as well. So they've got a large staff there. And, you know, it, it's good news and bad news. It's uh, it's great to have those companies to compete with. You know, a lot of them are very well-established companies. But also the good part is we are kind of the new kids on the block. And we offer this very agile culture where it's not steeped in layers of decision making. And It's not that corporate, yeah, that old school corporate culture. Yeah, well, it definitely validates your decision. <laughs> Everyone keeps moving in and shows that you've made the right choice. We've kind of touched on what's next for Jim Chark or, or kind of the, the rollout but in terms just on the people front what's the numbers you're looking at so obviously scale I think it's two, is it 200 plus employees now in the in the US 200 was the original target for the US uh, within a couple of years we're, we're up to 117 now we'll be 150 by July and then we'll grow again and that will pretty much max out this floor this 25,000 square foot floor you know and at that point we'll need to get ahead of the game and think about how we're going to expand there is no plan to put multiple offices around the country. It wasn't, I was uh, 18 years old, I was working on the floors uh, in Bristol as a banker, and one of the lads sort of turned up, so I've got this new job, I've started working in a, in a P department in a young offenders prison. It's, it's just opened, it's a brand new prison, it's absolutely crazy. Every day is completely mental, but I absolutely love it. And he was just explaining sort of day to day and I thought, why, that's, that sounds pretty good. So I remember applying uh, and there was no jobs in the gym, but that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so that I sort of got a job as a prison officer, started there at the age of 20. It's interesting that you ask about the peer group because I remember the minute you part of your prison officer training course, you start when you're further down the road or, or getting close to sort of qualifying, if that's the right word, you start spending time on the wings and shadowing. And I remember they put me on a wing. The prison was a 400 bed prison that held young uh, young people 15 to 21 years old. So at 20 years old, they put me on a wing to shadow full of 18 to 21 year olds. That was one of my questions in terms of that. Yeah, that age difference is not as well. There isn't an age difference, is there? No, there wasn't. And I remember when we when we turned up from the first shift, it was a morning shift. And they said, right, a little bit of advice. Just walk it up and down the landings. Try and look at the name cards and remember where they are. You won't remember all of them, but if you have some idea, because everyone will try and play up because you're a new member of staff. And I just remember walking down the, the wings, looking at the names on the door, thinking... I know that one. I know that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when we unlocked for breakfast, it was like a school reunion. There was people I grew up with. There was people I've been on holiday with. It was just, I think they were more shocked to see me in uniform than I was to see them. Again, it was something that I'd not really thought about. I loved my job at West Brom and I loved being deputy to the head of community there, the director, Rob, he's been a huge like support to me and still is. And I'd like to say we're sort of friends, we're friends and we we support each other in our in our current roles. I think I was thinking a bit more long term. And I, I think I was thinking how many more jobs might I have. And I felt that I'd done loads of things, a real diverse range of things at West Brom. And again, you know, look, it's just chance. There's 20 clubs in the in the Premier League. There's 20 heads of community, not that many. And there's not a huge turn, turnover. So when the Leicester job came up, I think the Villa role has come up previously. And I'm only, I'm sitting here talking to you now, like less than three miles away from Villa's ground. But it seems a bit too close to home with West Brom, really. Mm. So when I saw the Leicester job, it was just kind of an ideal 
I do, you know what I thought? I thought, I've got a job and I love my job. I'll apply for this and let's see what happens. It wasn't like I needed a job or I had this, or I even had a kind of pathway where I wanted to be head of community. It just seemed to fall into place. And I think I went to that interview in a really relaxed mindset because I already had a job that I enjoyed. It wasn't like, right, I need to get out. I want to be head of community. Yeah, it's not all or nothing kind of, yeah. Yeah, not at all. And I don't, and I think possibly that contributed to me getting the job because I think just I was more relaxed. It was a professional discussion, you know, and and, and they offered it to me. And, I, and it took me a while to make my mind up because I still say now my heart's at West Brom, my head's at Leicester, because you can't work for a club for that long and not have an affinity to it. Yeah. Although now, obviously, like, you know, just Leicester City and the, the strength of the brand and a, a, a one-brand city and, you know, the, the ownership, which is well-publicised, and the, the genuine ownership and how our owners contribute to the regeneration of the city is, you know, it's another level, really. Trying to build a balance and establish positive habits is a challenge for all of us. Tom Clark Forrest shares his approach to finding balance. Yeah, I love uh, I love still watching sport and participating in sport. You know, try and go to the gym, keep fit fairly often, uh, play football. I used to play a bit of tennis and playing a bit more golf now as I'm getting older. But yeah, I think, you know, family first, always really big on family, spending time with my kids. I, you know, I don't want to contradict the culture that we've got at the organization, which is values led and well-being focused and, you know, I buy into that as well. I don't I don't want to be burning the midnight oil. I want to be spending time where I can with my family. You know, at times that is difficult and, and there's certain pressures that make that a challenge, but yeah, really want to have a good work-life balance. I think in terms of kind of mantras and things that I kind of go by in terms of leadership, I wouldn't say there's any that I live and die by, but, you know, I really believe in that notion of controlling what we can control. You know, we can't control what happens, but we can control our response to what happens really like that. I think I really want to prioritize happiness. And I think that comes from meaning and purpose. And there's this kind of stoic principle of want what you already have and you'll always be happy. And that's around your expectations. I think that's really important. Got my personal values that I suppose leak into leadership around wanting to leave the world a better place, integrity, caring, compassion, want to create something of of value. But we have we have a few kind of things internally as well around every day school day we want to always be learning how can we be better We've got this thing about focus where we want the most important thing sorry the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing and i think as we've grown and developed it's easy sometimes to get distracted but we really need to be crystal clear on what is our purpose? What is it we're striving for this 90 days, this quarter? And what is our action plan for this year? That kind of goal and thread is, is really important. Finding your passion is not straightforward. We discuss our childhood experience with all our guests. Tom Gribbin and Peter Arch share what helped shape them. And Stephanie Hilborn gives advice for dads that are raising girls. You know, some people are naturally gifted. My sister is, she's a vet. And ever since she was five or six, she's just obsessed with animals. She just loved animals. And she'll say she kind of loves animals more than more than people mm. you know and she just nurtured animals and she's so she's perfect she found her thing and it just naturally happened but and again it's sport like if you're really quick oh look you'll be good right you'll be in the athletics team right you'll join an athletics club all right you can maybe run for your unit all right you and you can see a pathway and i think so if you do have natural gifts or you are lucky enough to be struck by something or someone but i do think it's hard when you know you're at school and you've got multiple different subjects going on extracurricular stuff you've got your who knows what your family situations mm. like at home um, and the environment that you grow up in, you know, and I remember actually back to sport, I played quite a lot of tennis and I got pretty good at tennis. And at time there was cricket on at school and the guys, the head teacher said, Gribbin, you're playing cricket this week. I said, no, no, I've got a tennis game for my cotting on my tennis club. They said, well, you have to cancel the, the, the tennis because you're playing for school. And I was like, well, I don't want, I want to play tennis. Yeah. <laughs> and so school in a way, it, did, it didn't quite, the sport thing, it didn't quite fit, you know, it didn't quite align. If they yeah. were a big tennis school, and it is funny actually, in the sixth form, 
I played in the first team tennis and I was the only player in my year that played tennis. It was everyone in the other years above and below me that also played. So I just sort of, I say, I say didn't fit in. I played um, playing basketball, which is what I still do. My dad put a hoop up in the in the garden at home. So and being taller, you know, naturally you sort of look at a sport like that. And then my cousin, uh, again, up in Hull, took me down to the local club and they signed me up. And this was when I was 16 and 17. And they just said, right, run around, like rebound, rebound. You know, we'll teach you to shoot, but just just rebound, like a bit like Dennis Rodman did for Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And I got quite good at, I got really good at basketball, played junior national league that year, won most improved player, which is a great perseverance. I was pretty useless when I started, but I was all right at the end of it. But then at school, there was a bunch of us that wanted to play basketball, but they, there was a court in the sports hall, but there wasn't a team. Yeah. And so we did play, you know, we played Hazel Mount, we played, you know, whole grammar and all these other schools, but we had to sort of hodgepodge a team together of people that sort of wanted to play. And, and I was actually one of the best players there, but because the school didn't, if that was rugby or cricket, I'd have had colours. I'd have been, yeah. and did I'd, you have been, been I'd have got that recognition because that's what the school was known for. Whereas basketball or even tennis was just a sort of sideline thing. And I, and I think that's, I, I might, I, I don't mean to sound bitter by it because you just, you, you carry on and you, you know, school's just one part of your life, but I do look back and think, you know what, there'll be kids now in, in any school that have got a particular interest, particularly passionate about something. But if that school isn't noticing that and catering for that, I do sort of yeah. worry that people then sort of feel a little bit disillusioned. Very competitive, very sporty family, also a product of our generation where, you know, everybody played sport anytime they could. You'd be up early in the morning playing before you go to school. You'd go to school. You'd have a break at 11 o'clock. We'd be playing soccer or football at the break. We'd run into lunch, scoff down our lunch and run out again. We'd be playing again. And then a, a short break at 3.20 when we had the, the afternoon break. Go home, rush your homework, and then out onto the field until you get yelled to uh, to come back and, and have your dinner and go to bed. It's I think it, obviously it's been well discussed and well documented, the change in culture and just how people don't have the ability to do that nowadays. I was going to say it's different, kind of different world now, the different distractions yeah. and, and fears, I suppose, from parents. Yeah, and I don't know if you've seen the recent Wayne Rooney documentary, just came out on Amazon Prime. You know, he speaks about it. That's all he did as a kid. He was out there and, and playing every moment that he got. So it's uh, it definitely will be interesting to see how we adapt. And obviously a lot of the, the great companies and organizations that you've had on your show are fill in that void they're providing an opportunity for people to get that play and that interaction socialization build the technical tactical physical and psychological elements they need to become a great player but it's now in a more organized way than it was when we grew up Well, you're really key to that, actually, mm. James, because what we found as well is the dad's attitude to their daughters is really, really important. So we've done a couple of things. I mean, we did this program called Daughters and Dads, which has come to an end, which is where we're getting dads and young girls, so sort of primary school age girls, coming, so dads come with their daughters on a, on one evening of the week and they get separated. The dads get put in pink T-shirts and the girls get put in blue and then and they have caution hours just separately as groups where, you know, the girls are bigged up and then the dads are basically introduced to what they're probably doing in terms of gender stereotyping you know are they using language like you look pretty you look beautiful are they worried that their girls will snap but they still chuck their boys around in the air that sort of thing and then and then they just do physical stuff together you know to kick a ball around or rough and tumble whatever it is and and from that we could see that a lot of the dads were quite emotional because the next day the little girls were coming and hugging them in the morning when they'd never done that before because they had a proper physical relationship with their dad or they were getting time with their dad that their brother wouldn't let them normally have because the brother wanted to monopolize the dad mm. for playing football or whatever so the dad's role is really important and what we're seeing is that whilst half of mothers are encouraging their sons and their daughters equally to get into sport half of dads are encouraging their dads to get their sons to get into sport but only 30 percent of dads are encouraging daughters to. So mm. there's this big gap in the dad's attitude to their daughter in, in terms of sport. Justin Merritt, Charlie Ford and Tom Gribbin give their youngest self advice that we can all learn from. I think I would have definitely taken on board some business advice and spent more time planning 
rather than there were loads of opportunities were coming to me. People would phone up and I'd be like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, let's do. And actually having a much more of a clear, this is the direction we want to go in rather than trying to do absolutely everything. But I think the best piece of advice I would give anybody that was in my situation is to talk to people, make time for other people. A lot of business opportunities have cut, that have come my way have been through having a conversation with someone, sitting down, might see them on their own on a training course. You know, many years ago, I went and sat down next to a guy at Lillishaw on one of the FA courses, a Japanese guy um, who was over on an international program nobody would I saw him on his own we had a conversation and yeah the last 15 years I've probably been out to Japan you know near near enough every year before Covid delivering football bringing teams over here but all of that was due to just having a chat (laughs) so yeah so uh, I get all the great business stories a big you know yeah having that conversation with someone and connecting with people and the other thing that I really learned was by finding somebody that can help you with analyzing the the finances as well to make your business sustainable and grow actually having somebody that can mentor you if you're like myself you're kind of learning a lot of it off the cuff and um Mm. and as i've got a lot older i've taken on board advice from people who are experts in those fields and that has massively helped yeah so it's get the right advice for what you need and recognizing what you're good at and uh you know maybe areas that you maybe need a bit of support wow that would be a long conversation (laughs) um i suppose the key the key things are is to and as my my dear grandma once said to me you know don't sweat the small things you can spend a lot of time in life consuming yourself either you know uh in, in time or you know in your head on things that are in the grand scheme of things in, insignificant so i'd probably go back and, and say that first of all i would kind of advise that life's a bit like white water rafting isn't it you know I, that's the way i like to see it there are times when you are genuinely going to be excited there are times when things are going to feel a bit scary and there are going to be times when quite frankly you want to close your eyes grip for dear life and just just ride it out but i wouldn't change anything else other than that because Quite frankly, the highs and the lows that I've been through have determined who I am today. And I wouldn't be the person that I am or I wouldn't be on the trajectory that I am if it wouldn't have been for those, uh, you know, for those situations. So I, I wouldn't go back and kind of warn, <laughs> the, warn the young me about some of the rough times that I've been through. Um, everything makes you who you are, right? I've always been, I mean, I can see now it's played out that I will work my socks off and I've got a lot of, you know, I've got a lot of energy and I've got a lot of will and drive. And I think I knew that when I was younger and the best advice I'd give myself will be, you know what, that gets you, that will get you an awful, awfully long way, whether you've got the natural abilities in that area of your life, whether it's sport professionally or even personally, but if, if you've got that in your locker as a basic part of of who you are do you know what you'll find a way through and I mentioned resilience a bit in the past but like you'll get knocked down it won't go quite right I've been in jobs I I took a job once and lasted there two days and ended up in a massive argument with my wife and parents because I said I'm not going back I can't I cannot stand this place Um, and they went and you've got to stick with them no it's not right and and I was I knew that was true and it definitely was right and I've had so many of those sort of you know fall off the horse dust yourself off get back on on. built built up a lot of resilience for it and i'm not hasn't turned into being negative and pessimistic about all the stuff but this is this like navigating our lives are are really hard and navigating our careers are are hard as well you don't know what's around the corner and i think the yeah the advice i'd give to myself is you know what those those like basic like if you've got the desire and the will and the drive like you will figure out how to navigate this it just might not be the this constant you know yeah, like, linear curve yeah. linear like oh it's going to go like continually up like you know if I look at my salary it's like you know that's one marker of this it's like if I look at my happiness it's definitely not in line with the with the salary from that perspective or security maybe if we if we look at it from a, a different perspective thank you for listening to this week's show you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud 
tweet us at coordinate sport or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports or on my account at James underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.